Well, when I first thought about coming to speak with y'all today, I did not know I was going to get so tore up. After watching that, I've watched that a hundred times, but that is our baby Ben, and he is absolutely the most beautiful thing that I've ever seen. And um, so thank y'all, and I'm sorry if I hurt your heart if I showed you that, because but he is, was so precious, and I just wanted you to see how beautiful and perfect and what a gift he was to us. But thank you for letting me come share my heart with you today. A couple things, now that I've got a little bit of crying out of the way, hopefully I'll keep it together while I'm sharing with you guys. And next, I have so much on my heart I want to share with you guys. I have it in my notes and in my Bible. So if I look down, that's what I'm doing. Just trying to make sure everything that is on my heart I share with y'all. But I trust that the Holy Spirit is here with us today and He will guide everything I have to share with y'all. So, you know, 25% of women experience a miscarriage or stillbirth. And just based alone on the amount of women that we have in this room with us today, I know that I'm not alone. And that many of you probably have experienced the same thing that we did. And even if it wasn't a miscarriage or stillbirth, chances are you've had something happen in your life that's been a struggle, that it's been a trial and a storm. But our story is not rooted in loss. It is rooted in love, in God's love. You know, things happen in our lives that we don't understand. I don't understand why I didn't get to keep in. He was perfect. At the time, I didn't understand why. We think, why me, Lord? Why do I have this illness? Why do I lose my job? Why do I get bullied? Why do I lose my baby? Why does God allow us to live in a world with so much suffering? But I don't believe God gives us pain. <gasps> but what Satan tries to use for bad, God turns to good. Sure. So, April 2015... I was 35 weeks pregnant. And we found out that our baby no longer had a heartbeat. When I got that news, I was at Northside Hospital in Atlanta. I had gone out of town with a group of friends, you know, probably my last trip before I delivered the baby. And I realized I could no longer feel our baby kick or move. And I just knew in my heart something was wrong. Just two nights earlier, Dan and I were getting ready for bed, and he was flipping all around and just looked like he was trying to find his way out. <laughs> Even when I got the news, I was just in complete disbelief. But I'm so thankful that the girls I was with were believers too, and they prayed for us and re really out of their way to help us in any way that they could. Even though I was in good hands, my husband was at home with our little boys, who at the time were five and three. And I know you guys know Porter and Cooper. They never miss DBS here, but they were little at the time. So we're nearly a five-hour drive from home, and the doctors didn't want to release me from the hospital. I thought that I was going to have to stay there in a strange place with a strange medical team. But, you know, the good Lord intercepted, and they agreed to let me leave as long as my friend would drive me home. And she drove me through the night to get me home to Dan. He met us at the hospital, and we walked in, and I felt like this huge sense of relief because I knew in my heart we were going to go up there, and the doctor was going to find the baby's heartbeat because obviously the equipment that they used in Atlanta was just messed up, and um, the doctor couldn't find the heartbeat. I don't know if I was in denial, but I believe even then that anything was possible with God. But the words came, I'm sorry, we can't find his heartbeat. And we're going to have to induce you and the baby. A few hours passed and friends and family came. You know, Pastor David came to visit us. Um, our church family gathered together and prayed for us. And after some hours, our third son was born, and we named him Bennett Ellis Norwood, Ben for short. 
He's named after my grandfather, my mom's dad. And my mom told me that she looked up his name and it meant little blessed one. And we didn't have a name picked out at this time because we didn't know if he was going to be a boy or a girl. Dan and I are notorious for not picking names out either. So, uh, But I think we found the perfect name for him. <coughs> well, what happened to him is the umbilical cord got tied up around his neck and he was no longer able to get oxygen. So the very essential part that he needed to survive is what took his life. And roughly 10% of stillbirths are due to because of a cord incident. And our doctor told us, she was like, that's kind of the same percentage as being struck by lightning. And one of the things she told me that was so reassuring is that even if you had been in the hospital when you thought something was wrong, there's likely nothing that we could have done to save your baby. But we were so blessed with like caring nurses, you know, pastors, family and friends. People came and they cooked, they cleaned our house, they sent cards, flowers. God was so faithful to send all of these people to show us love and comfort. But in the midst of all these caring people, I was still so sad. Um, I just felt like there was a void in my life. Like I was physically ached with emotional pain. I was so disappointed with God. I had doubts and questioned every part of his plan. I would lay in bed for hours and listen to music. I would write in my journal and ugly cry a lot for most of the day. I would talk to God and question him and ask him, you know, why God? Surely you know how much we would have loved this baby. You would have known how much we cared for him. We would have raised him to know you, Lord. But in troubled times, we ask ourselves a lot. Why me, Lord? In my mind, I was justifying the loss, thinking, I have obviously done something really bad, and I'm suffering because of past choices I made. But the enemy tried to take my pain and suffering and use it to drive a wedge between me and the Lord. And he was prompting these thoughts in my mind. But like I told you, what Satan tried to use for bad, God turned to good. Right. And, and if you have your Bible today and you want to follow along with me, you can. Um, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. You probably already know it without me even telling you what it is. But Paul's writing a letter to his Christian friends in Rome. And he says in verse 28, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This doesn't mean we'll receive that earth-shattering diagnosis or we buried our child or we lost somebody that we love, that everything that happens to us is good. You often hear people ask, you all know what I'm talking about. People come up to you and they say, how are you? And you'll say, God is good. And then they respond. All the time. All the time. God is good all the time. <laughs> but you might be living in a situation right now that is not good. Your heart might be broken. You might be having troubles in your marriage. Facing financial hardships. We all face trials in our life. Amen. But the word of God assures us that he's able to turn every circumstance into our long-range good. Not in our time, but in God's time. Amen. And when you have troubles and trials in your life, a lot of times, you know, we search for people that have lived through something similar to get advice from, you know, to find your motivation, you know, like, what did you do to get through this hard time? So, consider the story of Joseph in Genesis. He is 11th of 12 sons of Jacob and Rachel, adored by his father. He loved Joseph more than all the other kids. But Joseph was confident and self-assured to a fault, so much so that his brothers resented him and really hated him. What happened next in this story is like a parent's first nightmare. 
basically just as like, hey, go check out up on your brothers. They're out there working and take care of their sheep. You know, they're farmers. Well, what happened? The brothers saw this as an opportunity to kill their brother. What they did, they brought Joseph's coat back covered in blood and told their father they found this coat. And Jacob recognizes the coat and he assumes some ferocious animal has devoured him and torn him to pieces. I can't imagine the guilt this father faced after, you know, he's thinking his son died and he sent him out into this situation. Breaks my heart. But what actually happens is the brothers were so jealous of Jacob that they planned to kill him. But one of his brothers spoke up and Judah said, Let's not do that. <coughs> Here are some Ishmaelites coming this way. Let's sell him. You know? These guys are going to Egypt. So they sell <coughs> Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. And at that time, Joseph is only 17 years old. <coughs> and I've seen a fair amount of youth today. Can you even imagine? your child being sold off to a foreign land at 17 years old. But what Satan turns for bad, God turns for good, right? J Joseph comes into Egypt and Potter, uh, one of the Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's officials, takes Joseph in as his slave. He's in charge of his whole entire house. He's a good worker. He's really pleased Potter. But Potiphar's wife recognizes how good-looking Joseph is. He's, like, super handsome. And she makes advances on him. But Joseph did not want any part of that. He was a smart guy. Well, it really hurt her feelings. So she decides she's going to tell her husband, this Hebrew guy you brought into our house, he tried to come after me. So naturally, you stand up for your wife, and he threw this slave into jail. And even in this situation, when Joseph's been sold off by his brothers, bought as a slave, and now thrown in jail, God was with Joseph. That's right. Because the warden put Joseph in charge of the whole prison, and he trusted him. And because of that experience, Joseph had the opportunity to meet the king's cupbearer and the baker. They're all in jail together. And the cupbearer and the baker, they have these dreams. And they're wanting somebody to interpret them because that's kind of what they're used to and they've seen the Pharaoh do. And Joseph lets them know, you know, I can't do this, but God can. So Joseph interprets the dream for them and they find out that he was 100% correct. And he tells them, y'all remember me when you get out of here. You know, like, put in a good word for me. Get me out of here. Well, they forget about him. <gasps> and they leave him in jail. And he stays in jail for two more years. Okay? Well, Pharaoh has a horrible dream. He is wrecked. He calls the wise men and the magicians and all the people. Tell me what this means. You know, I'm just, my spirit is wrecked. Nobody can do it. And the cupbearer remembers, hey, when I was in prison, I met this guy, and he told me exactly what my dream meant. Maybe he could help you. So Pharaoh sends Joseph. <coughs> Joseph comes up, and he told him the dream. And he's like, I can't help you, but God can. He has all the answers that you need. Sure. But the interpretation Joseph gave, it pleased Pharaoh. So at that moment... Pharaoh liked the plan that Joseph did. And you guys remember, he's talking about, you know, there's going to be seven years of abundance and then uh, seven years where they're going to not have any food. And Pharaoh basically puts Joseph in charge of all the land. So he's 17 when he gets sold into slavery. He spends... 11 years as a slave and two years in prison. So he was 17 when his brothers sold him. He's now 30 years old when he comes and becomes in charge of all of Egypt. God rescued Joseph. 
And we forget that God is able to help us fight our battles. And Joseph drew closer to God. Even through that horrible thing he was going through, he still trusted God. But this is the part that I really like. So in Genesis chapter 45, <laughs> so the time of abundance has passed, they're in the period of famine that reaches beyond Egypt. Even Joseph's family is starting to feel hungry. I mean, they're like, okay, we've heard Egypt has all this grain. So Jacob sends his, the kids into Egypt, go get us some grain. Well, of course they're going to come in contact with Joseph because like, he's the head guy in charge now, right? And Joseph at first does not let them know who he is. But look, and y'all read with me, Genesis chapter 45, verse 4. He says to them, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been a famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will not be plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. God used the actions, the evil actions of Joseph's brothers to fulfill his ultimate plan. Not a week later. It took some time later for them to see God's goodness in the situation. But God is the ultimate power. Amen. And his plans are not dictated by what we do. When other people use evils against you or your family, think about them and remember, maybe they are just God's tools. And they are doing something in your life to bring you through it. But in the last chapter of Genesis, and the famine's gone through, and we're here at like Genesis chapter 50, Joseph's dad, Jacob, dies. And the brothers are like, oh no, daddy has passed. He is really going to come after us now. They are worried. And he's like, They're, he's going to get us back for all those bad things we did to him. But you know what he says? Genesis 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So when I told you before, Paul was writing his letter to his Roman friends, or his Christian Roman friends, you know, he's thinking back to this story of Joseph. God brought good from the brother's evil deed. What Potiphar's wife tried to do to Joseph in the false accusation, the cupbearers forgetting about him, the neglect, the seven years of famine. It taught Joseph that God brings evil from those who trust him. Do we trust God enough to wait patiently for him to bring good out of bad situations? You know, as Christians, we learn to accept the pain we go through and not resent it. Life throws us many curveballs, and we have questions about our faith sometimes. But God can use the trials in our life to show us that his love is real. That's right. If we choose to accept that his plans are better than our own. Mm -hmm. But at the worst time in my life, when I felt like everything was crumbling all around me, I could see God's love was real. God cares so much about us that he can remedy whatever troubles we face. And there are times in life when you want to run away and hide. Like when I was laid in the bed, I just wanted to pull the covers up over my face and close my eyes for a really long time. And we might be scared or overwhelmed or you feel hopeless. At that time, when I wanted to hide, God kept bringing scripture into my mind. And one of the verses that was always on my heart, Psalms 46, chapter 1, and I'm so glad that you brought that up earlier when you shared um, your verse. But the beginning of that, the terrorist earlier, earlier, it says, God is our refuge and our strength, 
and ever-present help in trouble. Amen. He is our safe place in total devastation. Our fortress when we are defenseless and weak. We can feel safe in his strength. And anything that comes at us to make us feel anxious or scared, God is right by our side. When I needed a safe place, the Holy Spirit brought that verse into my heart and put it on my mind over and over and over again. But when I learned to accept the pain and the grief that we experienced, I look for God's presence in my life to comfort me. I search for God's faithfulness. And what I mean, I was looking for evidence of God's love for me. Because people would tell me, you know, God loves you so much. And I knew deep down, he did love me. But there was a short period of time I was struggling to recognize the good things in my life. When I was asking God, please let me see clearly. Let me see all the good things you've done for me. I found so much love. To begin with, I found two perfect, healthy blessings for Aaron Cooper. It was a blessing that I could even conceive a child. I know so many women that struggle with infertility. I got to be the vessel that God used to give Ben 35 weeks of life. I'm thankful. I saw God was good. He gave me a great husband, Dan. He was especially supportive, right by my side, even by the most difficult times. One of the hardest things we had to do was tell our boys that were three and five what had happened because they knew I was pregnant. I had been out of town and they had not seen me for several days. And I came home, Dan brought me home from the hospital. The boys had been with his mom. And, you know, we sat him down trying to talk to a three and five year old as calmly as you can. And we said, you know, mommy had the baby, it was a boy. We named him Ben, but we didn't get to bring him home from the hospital. He went home to be with Jesus and your brothers in heaven. And Porter immediately looked at us and said, that's not fair. He got to go to heaven before I did. <laughs> it just made me laugh and smile. That's a precious reminder that as Christians, you know, our long-range promise is eternity with Jesus in heaven. Ben got to pass. Ben got to go early. In a way, almost made me feel a little bit selfish for wishing he could have stayed with me instead of bypassing this whole entire messed up world. Instead, he got to head straight for glory. That's right. But you know, God's timing is perfect. His plans are better than our plans. And I think a lot about how we would have responded if this had been our first child, you know, if this had happened five years earlier, you know, neither Dan nor myself were as firm in our foundation with the Lord as we were when we had been. I would equate our relationship with the Lord like your distant cousins you see at the reunion like once a year, and you talk to them for 30 seconds kind of awkwardly, like, we knew about them, and we believed that they were there, but we didn't talk to them on a regular basis. We didn't make an effort to ever get to know them like we did before Ben was born. And I'm convinced instead of reaching out for God, I would have ran away. I would have been angry, and no doubt our marriage would have suffered like many marriages do after you have a loss. But when we are rooted in God's love and rooted in his word, we see how good God is. Sure. And how much he loves us. God still answers prayers, but it's in his way, in his time, and not according to what we think is best. That's right. But what God knows is best for us. I have a journal entry in 10 days after Ben was born, April 27, 2015, thanking God for answering three prayers. I had been praying for five years. God was so good to make it clear to me that he was there and he was powerful but personal. And I prayed, these are my prayers, I'll share them with you guys, that Dan would accept his, spiritual, his role as spiritual leader of our house and his heart would be softened and that we would grow closer as husband and wife. Fairly simple, but all three prayers were answered. And the day I felt absolute confirmation in that, 
I can remember so clearly. I was sitting on her son's porch, probably still in my pajamas, drinking coffee, and Dan called to check on me, and he's like, you know, I'm just listening to the radio, and he's like, I just can't explain it. But I can just feel like my heart's been softened. His exact words, my exact words to the Lord. And I can truthfully see God's goodness in the situation. You know, I would never wish anyone to encounter a situation like what we went through. But I don't ever want to go back to the person I was before. God used the loss of our child to change me in ways I'm grateful for. But in the suffering goddess, God made himself known to us in ways we could never imagine. We had two choices. Believe God and believe his promises are true or don't. When we draw God, when we draw near to God, God draws near to us. And if we hold on to Him, He will hold on to you. It's not about if, but when. James, Jesus' brother, writes in James chapter 1, verse 2, count it all joy when you encounter trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. He does not say if, but when. There's always going to be something that happens to every single one of us in our life as a struggle. Don't wait until you encounter the trials of your life to be close to God. Get rooted in his word now and develop a personal relationship with the Lord. When the storm comes and you're rooted so deeply in the word, you can persevere, not because of your own strength, but because of God's. And remember, like we said a bunch of times today, what Satan intends to use for bad, God can make it good in our time, in his time, not ours. And he will be faithful to answer your prayers in the way he sees best. Because remember, Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. For example, I don't know if y'all saw him today. Our sweet Finn, our fourth son. Um, I think we kind of, you know, wanted three children. And even after um, we had been... You know, my heart still felt like uh, our family was incomplete. And we tried again and had a miscarriage. Um, so Ben was born in April. I had another miscarriage in August. And I'm like, Dan, done with this for a little while. Um, and I just took some time to work on myself and work on my relationship with the Lord. And eventually it became time again. When I felt like, you know, God said, try again. God is so faithful, faithful. And it, I think it was February 11th, 2015. I just had a, a memory come back to mind that I found I was pregnant with Finn. So our little Finn is our, our rainbow baby. You know, and you think about it, when you go through the storms of life, you know, God sent me a rainbow, his promise that, God is good, and he's so faithful to hear and answer our prayers. And I cannot tell y'all how much that child lights up all of our lives. And many of you, if you're on social media, you see I share all kinds of pictures of him. And I know they make y'all smile as much as he does us. I'm going to wrap it up soon. And, you know, I just want to ask you guys to consider... If you're not in the place in your life right now, when you're imagining yourself going through a storm or a trial, that you use today to get right with the Lord and come before Him and bear your heart, He's there. He's never stopped loving you. But I beg you, I do not know how people go through things in their life without being rooted in the Word of God. Amen. But, you know, as we prepare to leave today, I want to ask you guys um, to join me in praying for uh, one of my friends. Um, as you mentioned, I helped start a group called...
Paul Cares Club of Union County, and it's for moms. You know, Kayla um, comes, and we have other moms who have experienced a loss through miscarriage, you know, atopic pregnancy, stillbirth, early infant loss. And we met one mom, and um, she had a little girl about 28 weeks. Well, just on Friday, she was pregnant with her second child, again at 28 weeks, and the child died. Um, despite, I mean, the, the medical team, they were really on top of it this time and tried everything that they could to help her. And this girl, y'all, she just needed a win in her life. She's had so much suffering, so much loss, and I just really hoped for her that she was going to be able to experience that this would be the thing that drew her close to the Lord. So y'all, please join me in praying for Stacy and her husband, Justin, and lift them up in prayer as she recovers and just pray that God's going to send people in her life to witness to her and that she would choose to run to him and to seek him in this storm. And, you know, whatever you guys are, are going through, I know I, I saw the prayer list. There are a lot of people on it. We all have things going in our life, but make an effort to spend some time with the Lord and get to, to know his word. The thing that helped me the most, ironically, is a children's CD where I really, when I was going through a loss of Ben, so much scripture was in my mind because I could sing it. My sister, one of them, um, had given me a CD four years before this that I never opened. And then finally, I, I found it one day, and Porter and I would listen to it all the time in the car. And the theme of it was courage. And I'll tell you, I didn't know how much I was going to need the Word of God until I went through that storm with Ben. Um, so I, I thank you guys today for um, letting me share uh, our story and our heart. And thank you for, for listening. And um, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for each one of you guys, and then Tara's going to come up and sing. And um, so if you guys would just bow your heads in prayer today. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for, for your love. Thank you for loving us when we're unlovable. Thank you for drawing near to us in every single storm. Lord, thank you for the word of God that you've given us to lean on in tough times. I lift up to you the people, Lord, that you know the hearts of the ones that are in the rooms tonight or today that are struggling with something. Lord, I just pray that you would send them a verse. Lord, use the Holy Spirit to prompt them with something to give them peace of mind and to give them courage to weather the storm. And as we go out into the world, Lord, that people would see no matter what storm that we go through because of God's great love that we get through with it. We believe in him that we're eternity-minded, that nothing that we suffer today compares to the glory that we receive in heaven. And you're going to be praying. Thank you.